Yes, Sandy. Yes. What? <laughs> Did you hear that phone? We having some technical issues, so I had to use my phone to get, and I my phone had the scripture on it. So now I need to. I didn't memorize this particular portion of the Bible. Thank you, Dorena. Never mind. Go ahead. Probably more than we needed to know. But. Well, <laughs> we, got, we got time to finish. Okay, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every year, yeah. our family buys an ornament to kind of commemorate something special that happened that year. And I found an ornament that I think really summed things up for our family in 2020, and it brought you one. Okay. You ready? Okay. 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 Get ready for this. Here you go. This is for you. This is a little ornament. Now, for those folks of you who can't see it, it's a Grinchy hand holding a face mask, and it's saying, 2020, stink, stay, stuck. That's for me? Yeah. <laughs> That's a keeper. Well, like every year, look a little better. <laughs> you know, even though 2020 was really tough for all of us, yet I know we probably all had blessings in our family that uh, we need to, to think about. You know, like we had a new grandson that I wouldn't have missed for the world. Amen. And to combat the 2020 blues, I've tried to spend more time thanking God for his provision and less time whining, which is a challenge. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And God doesn't will us to give thanks so he can feel appreciated. God made us and tells us to give thanks because he knows it is good for us. I found many scientific studies on gratitude, and here's the, kind of the gist or summary of what I learned. Did you know that humans have something called a negativity bias? You heard of that? Yeah. We pay more attention to the bad stuff happening than the good stuff by a ratio of three to one. Yikes, that's not good. Do you suppose that's why of the 10 lepers Jesus healed, only how many came back to thank him? One. Studies compared people who were intentionally and regularly grateful to those who weren't. And they found that people showing gratitude had higher levels of activity in the hypothalamus. I said that right? That's a part of the brain that controls many essential body functions like eating and drinking and sleeping and has a huge influence on our metabolism and stress levels. So the conclusion came to gratitude improves physical and mental health. Grateful people report fewer aches and pains feel healthier than less grateful people, they sleep better, suffer less depression and anxiety, have lower toxic emotions like regret and envy, and have increased levels of determination, enthusiasm, and energy. Amen. Clearly, giving thanks does a lot more for us than it does for God. This year, my wish for us is to daily enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Amen. Amen, Amen indeed. Our scripture today, Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> it comes from Psalm 95, it may be familiar to you. It says, Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. You are here. Thank you. 
till up the soil of our hearts. God, make us aware of your presence within us. Thank you, God, that you love us, that you're coming for us, and that you have a plan we can trust. We love you, Lord, and we just surrender this morning to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 He's good. Sing it with us. He is good. He is God.
our own little heavenly choir here today. We'll step back to our mics. We'll just repeat that again. You're good. Sing with us.
You guys know that word? That's the kind of resolve I'm talking about. The first step, the foundation, if we're going to invest in God's kingdom, is investing in our own relationship with him. I will rarely talk about things like this. I'm always about what's next and about others. But if we're going to do any of the stuff God has us to do, we have to be the people he's called us to be. And so this first little section of, 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 of sermons for the year, this Resolve series, is about resolving something very important. And it starts with our own relationship with God. If you have a saving knowledge of Jesus, that is the first thing. But the very next ongoing priority that we'll spend the next few weeks on is this. How can we resolve, how can we be firmly determined to live holy lives? Did you know that we're a holiness denomination and a holiness church? Yes. Yes. Great. And I want to spend a lot of time on that, but I'm going to talk a lot about holiness. Today's message is called Biblical Obedience. And the big question, which you'll love if you're a parent or a child, which is everybody is, what is the definition of obedience? What does that even mean? Well, as humans have understood it and applied it, obedience, I think, is kind of a sliding target, a moving thing, isn't it? Yeah. No. When our kids were little, we had a saying, and I now can't remember it exactly. <clears throat> but when our kids would begin to, they're very little, and they, we'd tell them to do something, and they'd be, we would say, hey, what is obedience? Where's my wife? Are you in the room here? <laughs> what would they say? They would say something like, um, total and immediate. I think that's actually what it was, because we had taught them obedience to mom and dad is totally obedient, do everything you're told, and do it now. So I'm talking like three years old, you know, like totally obedient. <laughs> now I can tell you that my three daughters, none of whom were obedient to show up to church today, by the way, <laughs> probably asleep, don't know. I can tell you that they've not, this is crazy, you're going to, this is going to be an audible what? My three daughters have not always been perfectly and totally and immediately obedient. What? Oh. Right? Come on. It's jackpot of a dad and you're not going to just listen. <laughs> but, here's the deal though. As a human, uh, with a human understanding and expectation of obedience, I would say our girls are obedient children. Because we tend to base those things on sort of a curve. They're not crazy, they're not hugely rebellious that I know of. They've never done anything awful. I was just thinking, you know, Lauren's like, or Hallie especially, you know, those two, they've never been in any real trouble, like ever. They're like the easiest kids to raise. I get zero credit for it. I might be making fun of Natalie right now, but she's not here, so that's what she gets. I think that would be a fair label. I think if most people could kind of watch a video of our lives, they'd say, those are good kids. Those are pretty decent kids. But I want to demonstrate for you something about obedience. And I hope it works. <coughs> there was a comical thing happening earlier when I was trying to make this work. I, I made something. I made a pulley. Look at this. It's pretty impressive. Now, there's a crescent wrench tied to the end, so it could be dangerous. It's, it's, not, it's not moving. It's got to move or this won't work. Come on. It's, it's not heavy enough, what's happening? This is really going to destroy my entire sermon. Come on, get down, get down. Okay, hold on, let me back up first. Kathy, you assured me this would work. Lane Kathy. Well, dang it! All right, well, here's the deal. Uh, there's a key up there. I don't, I, don't know you, I don't know if you ever see that key. Hey, it's not obedient. This is ridiculous. Thank you, John. This is, this is working. John, you're like some kind of engineering architect guy. How do I make this come down? Larry, get the ladder. There's a ton of weight up there. The problem is, this is a heavy cable. Oh, there you go. John, is this, is this the way, John? All right, now it's time. So let's just, let's just, let's use our imagination. I'll tell you what, I had to carry a ladder out of the shop. We're doing this. We're going to get some more. My goodness. My goodness. Is this on YouTube? Yes, it's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this goes viral. <laughs> this is ridiculous. This is so not the way things are supposed to go. All of the people that want reference are going crazy right now. Okay. Yeah, well, if we were talking about patience, this would be a great sermon illustration. Anyway, let's pretend that that thing's moving freely. Here's how obedience works, okay? Here's how it works. 
I made a fake key right there, which you can see. It's orange. Oh, it's yes. It's made of paper. Now, let's pretend that that key is to a brand new dream car, some kind of McLaren or Ferrari or, or something really amazing, right? And I tell Hallie, my middle, oh, let's not do that. I tell Lauren, my youngest daughter, who will get her license in 16 months, listen, <coughs> hung this key up here. <coughs> this key is to your dream car. You with me? Um, you gotta use your imagination, because this isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to her, at the end of 16 months, if you are obedient, if you have lived obediently to your mother and father, you can have the key. Right? Now, let's say there are some rules. <coughs> the rules are, rules are no help, no using anything, no ladders, no throwing anything, no touching the rope. You just have to jump up and get the key, right? <laughs> now, it's about 17 and a half feet in the air from, from the floor. <clears throat> no human alive, I did the math, I looked at records, no human in the history of the world is tall enough and can jump high enough to get that. It's impossible. Nobody can get 19 feet in the air with their hand ever that I'm aware of, okay? So it's impossible, right? So if I brought her in right now and said, you can have this car, but you've got to grab that key, no chance, right? None. But then I say, listen, honey, over the next 16 months, if you're obedient, you can have the car. And here's how it works. <coughs> she gets straight A's. I, I, I drop the key, which would be happening right now would be an excellent illustration, except it's not. <laughs> so, so she gets straight A's, and I drop that thing, maybe a foot, right? Keeps her room clean for the day, and I drop it a foot. But then, then she pops off to her mom, right? Her mom says to do something, and she gives her lip. Pull it back up. <laughs> right? You with me? Yes. yes. <clears throat> then Ed stops by and says, I need help moving some wood. And Lauren says, hey, I'll, I'd be happy to help you, Mr. Kimoy. And she goes and helps. And I think, what a good, obedient child. And I, I lower it, right? Then I catch her at 11 o'clock at night, past bedtime, on her phone. Pull it back up. Isn't that how obedience works in life, really, for us? I mean, honestly, it's not total and it's not immediate. But as humans understand it, that's the way I kind of understand it. This is ridiculous that that's not moving because it'd be so powerful. <laughs> so here's the question for today then. How does obedience like this work with God? So let's say it's not a car. Let's say that God created all humans. And when he first started, he made us, and he put us in this perfect world, in a perfect garden, and we screwed it all up by being disobedient. Let's say that God said, here's the deal. You can stay here in this amazing place unless you eat the fruit from that one tree. Be obedient to me. Don't touch that tree. And let's say that Adam and Eve were their names, and let's say that they ate the fruit of the tree. And let's say in the book of Genesis then, that God said, that's it. You've been disobedient. You can no longer stay here because I require perfect obedience. So I'm going to kick you out. I'm going to put a gate on this thing and I'm going to lock it and I'm going to put guards in front of it. You can't get in unless you have a key. That's exactly what happened, right? Yeah. That's how it works. Right? Yes. Now, okay. <clears throat> now imagine God said, <clears throat> welcome Welcome. Welcome to Stan. Stan has just died. and Stan's in heaven. He's waiting in line. He's really excited. Stan says, man, I'm excited. I wasn't the best guy, but I surely wasn't the worst guy. I'm Stan Hall. I'm a decent man. I did what I thought was right most of the time. I never threw a golf club. I never said a bad word on the golf course, at least when I was with my pastor, for sure. I can verify that. He's got a great attitude. He brings me candy bars that I eat after the night bowl every time. Yeah, it's great. And Stan comes in and his key is sitting on the ground. Which it would be if my illustration was working. It would be very powerful. <laughs> and God says, hey, let me, let me pull out my Stan Hall file here. Stan, I'm going way back before you even knew me. Oh boy, Stan. And he starts pulling it, pulling it. And then he gets to his life later. Oh, he did some good thing, you know. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. No matter how great you are, no matter how great Stan is, no matter how great any human is, that thing, because God has a different version of what obedience is, that thing will forever be 19 feet in the air. And in fact, since we're imagining anyway, 
Imagine it was 19 million feet in the air. It's, it's, it's impossible. Right? If God said, there's the key to heaven, come on in if you are obedient enough to grab it. Nobody's going to make it, right? It's 19 million feet in the air. It is absolutely, hope you're getting this, it is impossible with that human idea of obedience. It is impossible to live a life on this planet that is obedient enough to be able to reach the key to heaven. It will never happen, ever, for anyone. <clears throat> so, let's talk about God's obedience, because that seems sort of, that seems sort of unfair, doesn't it? Like, that's not fair. No human can grab it. God, you made us unable to grab the key. This is unfair. So let me tell you a few things I know about obedience. No slides today, I apologize. But we will um, have the notes available later. I'll email them out. We can get them. Number one, obedience to God. This is not humans now. This is God. Obedience to God is an absolute proposition. It's all or nothing. Perfection is the standard. When I was a, an athlete many, many years ago, I was one of those crazy competitive people where, like, second place is just the first loser. <laughs> that was my whole thing, right? That, that's how I am. Like, that's how I felt. Like, hey, you got second place. So what? I'm the first loser. Well, here's interesting. I hope this doesn't sound mean because it's true. You know what second place in life, if you're trying to be obedient to God, gets you? It gets you first in line to go to hell. Congratulations, you were the most obedient of anybody. You can be first into hell. Or I guess you get to be last. So we'll line them up, we'll line them up, you know, inversely. So the best human, you can get in the back of the line so you don't have to go to hell for an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, you're probably familiar. It's a very famous verse that we use when we're trying to share the gospel. And it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, God's standard's perfection. You sin once, whoosh, 19 million feet in the air. Nothing you can do to bring it down, ever. Listen to me carefully. It's not a trick. It is impossible to bring that key back down. It will never happen, ever, as soon as you sin once. It's 19 million feet in the air. Even in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel, he said, no one is holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. There's no one like you. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus came and we thought, great, a Messiah. He'll make it easier for us. He's the Messiah. You know what he said? Hey, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Clearly, we can't obtain the standard. Right? But then we began to think, and maybe first century people began to think, and maybe Peter and James and John thought, well, Jesus, I mean, the Messiah is here, and so maybe he'll explain this to us. And he did. Jesus revealed this. God doesn't just judge your obedience of action, but of intent, heart, and mind. In chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus said, You've heard it was said, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And they're thinking, okay, exactly. He's going to give us, he's going to tell us how this works, how we are going to reach the key. And he says, I'll tell you what, if you are even angry with someone else, you're subject to judgment. And if you say you fool, to someone, you're in danger of the fire of hell. At this point, I would raise the key even higher, which I now can't do. <laughs> Jesus didn't lower the standard. He actually raised it. He made it harder. So it went from 19 million feet to 190 million feet, to a gazillion feet. If I'm judged by my actions compared to most of the world because I became a Christian pretty young, I'd probably be in the front half of the line. But if you want to get into my thoughts, and every time I've thought something incorrect or considered something incorrect or, or whatever, oh, now I'm in big trouble. Back of the line. Yeah, back of the line. <laughs> Front of the line in this case, right? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. Every man on the planet would be just completely out of it. <laughs> One of the hardest things as a man to overcome, to have victory in. You're done. I'm not being funny. Imagine standing at the gates, which will happen. You will stand at the gates of the heaven. And this won't happen. And if it did, it would work, of course. But there will be a key. And God will say, hey, it's locked. I will let you in. But first, got to judge what you did. Not just your actions, but your thoughts and your heart. And guess what? You lose. You all lose. We can pick the 
the most amazing godly person in the room. No chance. We could pick the most Mother Teresa. No chance. None, because the standards do I. Here's my next point, which would be on the screen if I was doing the screen thing today. This is a big, big point for today. Are you ready? God's standard of obedience is unattainable. It is like throwing a ball to knock down milk jugs at the carnival. It's rigged. I'm being completely serious. <clears throat> the pathway to heaven is rigged against every human. Can't do it because God gave us free will and we're sinners. I mean, it's right there in the Bible. It says, I made you. All have sinned and anyone who sins can't get in. Ball game. And on top of that, then he says to us, but hey, be perfect. Mm. <laughs> what is that? It's rigged. Listen, you, you're going to like this part. <clears throat> even with Jesus' help, even through relationship with him, you will never be able to reach the key. And he will never, ever say, hey, I know you. I'll bring the key down. Let my death bring this key down. That's never going to happen. The death of Jesus doesn't make you obedient. It doesn't mean you never sin. You're still guilty. But the good news is, when you have a saving relationship with Jesus, there is a path. Listen, Paul said, Paul probably had a bigger faith than all of us combined, right? I mean, the Apostle Paul, pretty credible in terms of obedience. And Paul himself, in Romans, I mean, Paul was beaten and shipwrecked and just killed for his faith. And in Romans 7, the great Paul, who saw Jesus in the flesh on a, I mean, come on, right? This is what he said. I do not do what I want to do. I do the things I hate. I have the desire to do what's right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. That's Paul. In other words, Paul's going, oh man, no chance, right? None. It's Paul. The good news is, even though we'll never touch that key, Jesus will never go get the key, he will never bring down the key, God will never cause a dove to go up and carry, that will never happen. You're not ever going to unlock the door to heaven. It will never happen. But the good news is, Jesus will never say, you're with me, here's the key. But what he will say is, bro, you don't need the key. I'll, I'll open the door. I live on the other side. And I'll open it. It's a really important theological point. You're not suddenly worthy to get into heaven. Jesus just lets you in because he knows you. In fact, not only does he say, I'll open the gate, Jesus, in John 10, said, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. Good news. Faith and relationship with Jesus leads to eternal life. We don't need the key to get into heaven. We just need a saving relationship with Jesus, and he'll open the door. My kids don't need a key to get into my house. Ever. I will let my kids in. Right? And that's how God feels for us. <coughs> but, but here's the, here's the rub. Here's, here's the big question. All the rest of my notes are mostly scripture. Here we go. So here's, what, here's where I landed, okay? Stay with me. So obedience to God, according to his own standard, and the way he set it up, it's not my fault now, God set it up. It's unattainable. And there is no path of obedience that leads to eternal life. <clears throat> trying to get there, trying to get there through my own obedience will never work. Right? It has to be through Jesus letting me in because we're in relationship together. I'll never just be good enough. There's no path for me of obedience that will lead to heaven. So here's a couple questions I want to answer today. Why did Jesus tell us to be obedient if he knows we can't? And why would I even bother to try? It's really hard. And sometimes it's easier to just do what I want. Right? Yes. Well, I got one, two, three reasons. 
Number one. Why should we be obedient? Number one. An obedient life unlocks blessing for us and to the world. I'm not suggesting, as some would, that there's a direct equation type correlation where if I obediently give $100, God will bless me with 1000 within four days. That's not how that works. People live lives of obedience. Paul lived a life of obedience as best he could and was killed for his faith. That's not how that works. We've talked about this before. But it is universally true, it's absolute, that an obedient life unlocks this internal blessing. And many times it does, in fact, it does unlock even a material blessing. Because God's way is the best way. And God's way keeps us from harm. In Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament, God told Moses and the priests to tell the people this, if you fully obey the Lord and carefully follow his commands I give you, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come to you in a company if you obey your Lord. And then the rest of that chapter was just all these specific blessings, which I'm not going to read to you, but it's a bunch of them. So way back in the Old Testament, way back in Deuteronomy, God says, if you're obedient, things will work out for you. If you're not obedient, I'm going to send armies to crush you. And of course, the entire Old Testament is this cycle of, we're really sorry, we'll be obedient. Okay, great, here you go. Oh, we don't really want to listen to God. All right, here comes an army to crush you. Well, now we're really sorry. It's like taking your daughter's phone away. Dad, I promise I won't use my phone after a certain time. Okay, honey, you used your phone again. I know. Well, now I'm going to take it away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Dad, I promise I won't use it. Okay, here's your phone. Honey, you used your phone at the wrong time of day again. I'm really sorry. Well, give me your phone. It's just a cycle. It's vicious. <laughs> Praise the Lord that God's not like me. I would eventually just toss the dumb phone. Right? <laughs> the problem, as we make fun of the Old Testament folks, the problem is they, they had no shot at maintaining obedience because we can't reach that high. They never had a shot. But the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus now has empowered us to live more obedient lives. And so we, we cannot be perfectly obedient to God, as I've said several times. But in the eyes of the Father, we can be found in perfect obedience through our relationship with Jesus. You catch the difference there? It's not that suddenly we're perfectly obedient because that would negate the need for Jesus. But Jesus mediates for us and God looks through the veil of Christ and says, I'm going to count that one as obedient and as righteous and as just. Not because they inherently are, but because I'm viewing them through this filter of the blood of Jesus and they know you. They are in relationship with you. And so I will find them obedient and I will unlock blessing. Number two, if number one is that it unlocks blessing, number two is this. We need to be obedient because it, it is a witness in the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, put it on a stand and it will give light to everyone. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Acts chapter 2, super famous. They devoted themselves to teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the wonders and signs that performed. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions and gave to people in need. They continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes. and it, Blah, 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 blah. They were obedient. Right? And the end says, and the Lord added daily to their number. It was a witness to the people around them to go, wow, look how those people live. That looks good. <coughs> we're not obedient to God. We're just like everybody else. And nobody wants any part of that. They get enough of that. Well, everywhere else. Number three, which is perhaps my favorite. Because <clears throat> we don't inherently get anything. You know, the first one, we get something. We get to unlock blessing. The second one, we get to be a witness in the world. And we get to grow and say, look what we did. We're good people. Here's the third one. And really, it's the first one, but I put it third. The best reason to be obedient is because that's what you are when you're in love with someone. It's for the love and the glory of God. Jesus in John 14 didn't say, obey my commands and I will love you. He didn't say, obey my commands and you will be blessed. Obey my commands and you'll be a witness. Those things are all true. What he said was, if 
John 14, verse 15. If you love me, obey my commands. I will ask the Father and he'll give you the advocate, Holy Spirit, who will never leave. He leads you into all truth. The world can't receive him because it's not looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will live. And when I'm raised to life again, you'll know that I am the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. best reason to be obedient is because if you actually know the Lord and you love Him, then of course you'll be obedient because you want to please Him and you want to glorify Him. And the cool thing about God is that on top of all of that, it unlocks blessing and it unlocks a witness in the world. We actually get something out of the deal which we don't at all deserve because, you know, we're 19 gazillion feet too short to reach the standard. Your next question should be, great, thanks, Pastor Chris. How do I do that? Like, I, I mean, Paul couldn't do it. I don't, how am I supposed to live like this? Well, that's what the rest of the series is for. We're going to talk about living day by day, holy, whimsical holiness, I like to call it. We're going to talk about how community helps us. We're going to spend one week just on strongholds, on the things that keep sucking us back in, and on prayer and on how to live it. Before we do that, though, I want to close today by reading from Romans 6. Because Paul answered the same question. Here's what Paul said. He's talking about being saved and about the grace of God and about the fact that you're no longer under the law. Right? We're not judged. This is the law. We're no longer judged by that. It's through the eyes and the blood of Jesus. And so he's talking about all of that and he's saying, hey, you guys don't need to worry about the law anymore in terms of being freaked out. You are saved. God has blessed you. You're not under the law. You won't be judged this way. There's a whole other line, like the first class thing in the airport. There's a whole different line. So the back of the line says judgment line, but there's a second line, a little stanchion, and it says people who know Jesus. And that just gets you right in. It's a totally different line. You skip this entire step because you're not under this anymore. You know, that's not how we're judged if we're in Christ. And Paul then says this, after he says all that, much better than I could. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his grace? And then he says, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in death? For we died and were buried with Christ. And just as Christ raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we also have new lives. Since we've been united with Christ, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin can lose its power in our life. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from that power. And since we died with him, we know we will live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Should you, so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God. Do not let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument for evil. Instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead. But now you have new life. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. You live under grace. Slaves don't generally run back to their captor. And when we give over our lives to sin, that is what we are doing. And I cannot, <clears throat> I cannot with a clear conscience tell you what happens next when you do that. I don't know the mysteries of God. But I know that the language would suggest that there's some sense of possibility that if you want to run back to this kind of thing, you're able to. But guess what happens then? You've got to go through this line. 
We're saved by grace. This has nothing to do with it. But there is some suggestion that if you want to run back and be a slave again, okay, but just so you know, that means you're judged back under that law. I don't know that. I could be wrong. Maybe, <coughs> maybe you say a prayer and get baptized when you're five and do whatever you want the rest of your life and that's good enough. I kind of don't think so. <laughs> the next few weeks we're going to be talking about tools, talking about the how of living obediently, but it has to start with you. It has to start with the will, with the resolve to live in obedience to God. <clears throat> we can help you. We can give you tools. We can give you community. But you have to resolve to do it. Not because you will suddenly then be so perfect in God's eyes that you can reach this dumb key, which I still can't get to move. <laughs> but for the reasons I mentioned, for blessing, for a witness, and most importantly, because we love God and we want to see Him glorified and we want to please Him. So you have to choose today <coughs> which line am I going to live in? <coughs> Thank God that when you're in the fast track line, the Jesus line, and you mess up, he doesn't kick you into the other line. You've got to make that choice. But as long as you are resolute and you're saying, no, I'm in this line. I'm saved by grace, but I am, I am resolving to live obediently as I understand it to my God. Then we can do it. And the kicker is, then God's Holy Spirit begins to empower you to actually live that way, to actually look more like Jesus, to actually experience what we would call sanctification where you inwardly no longer have any desire to sin. Although we still mess up, we are inwardly no longer tossed about and trying to figure out who our master is and half slave and half not, what, what am I? There is a point where you can experience this. And your daily life changes significantly. And it's the best place to be. But your decision today is this, as we start this series, as we spend a whole year talking about how we can invest in the kingdom, you're going to miss out. It's like an IPO. Uh, an initial public offering. It's not a Ponzi scheme. <clears throat> it's a really good IPO. If you don't know what that is, sorry about that. But it's the opportunity to buy into a company that's about to go huge and make a ton of money. And we're not talking about money, but we have the opportunity to invest in what God wants to do in us. And you're going to miss out on the opportunity to be in on the ground floor if you can't get this part right. You have to resolve to say, I want to live a holy life. Preach holiness here. And we keep the same standard Jesus does, which is perfection. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to be a part of seeing God invest in and through us into the world, that we might reach people for Christ, that, that all may know the love and freedom found in Jesus, which is our mission, listen, you're going to be left out. Not by doing something wrong. We're all going to do stuff wrong. But if you don't have the resolve to say, I'm at least going to, I mean, I'm going to try it. I'm going to make the effort to resolve to say, God, through your spirit, empower me to be holy. Empower me to live a life of obedience to you that you might be glorified. That's a decision to have before you today. Lord God, we thank you today that, um, <coughs> that we are saved by grace. And I, it's kind of a weird concept, Father, as you know. And this discussion of law and salvation in the book of Romans I don't know that I explained it very well. So I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate that for each person, that you would make it known in our heads, correct anything I said that threw somebody off, Lord, and add the things I left out, so that we would all leave this place today knowing, here's what I have to do in my heart. Here's, here's the decision I have to make if I want to live this obedient life. I have to be willing to, to try, and I have to be able to understand that I can't do it of my own volition, but that God has to empower me. And I have to know that it's going to involve confessing some things, and it's going to involve repentance, it's going to involve community, and being willing to have accountability, and it's going to involve more prayer and more study of your scripture, and it's going to involve getting over these strongholds that have keep coming back on me like, like some kind of horrible disease every so often. Lord, we want to live this way. I want to live this way, and I want people to live this way. So Lord, put it to each of us who's live or who's listening or who's watching a year from now on the internet. Lord, we want to resolve. Not that we have the power to accomplish it, God, but we want to have the resolve to say, I serve the Most High God and I 
will be resolute in my conviction and in my commitment to living obediently because I love him and he loves me. This is our prayer, Lord. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if we get that part right, we can get to the other part, which is the Great Commission, which is how we like to close our times together. And before we do that, just one quick announcement. <clears throat> Some of our library books are back there on the tables. We don't want to just give them away because some people donate them and have been blessed by them. But um, in talking to some leaders and talking to people who run the library, it seems nobody's really taken enough advantage of it to make it worth having it here all the time. So if you want to take any of those books, you're welcome to. Please use hand sanitizer if you touch a book and don't keep it. Larry put a $100 bill in one book. <laughs> you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to open the books before you take it. You gotta just take it. <laughs> I might get the golden ticket. Yeah. yeah, I'll take them all. Yeah, yeah it's, worth, it's, it's worth way more than $100 if you'll take them all to me. Uh, just put that out there. I'll give you 100 bucks if you take them all. Um, so if you want the books, please take them. Give them as gifts. Uh, do whatever you like. And at the end of January, we'll donate them to somebody who could use them, who doesn't have access to Kindles and things like that. Would you stand with me? We're going to close, as we always do. And if you're wondering why we say this every week, we're going to continue to say it until we've accomplished it, which is the safer path. Jesus came to his disciples and his followers before he ascended back to heaven. And he said this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he said this, stay with me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Hallelujah, amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic week. Oh, man.